Yeah. To support, uh, yeah. 9 million hey guys, I um, I wanted to, I wanted to just right share something with you. Uh, uh, so, uh, absolute, just had a meeting. Uh, um, I just had a meeting this morning with a, a dear friend. I actually think of him more of a mentor than a friend of mine. And he and I were talking about economic systems that give opportunity. Now, I need you guys to follow me on this because. One of the things I was thinking about when I was preparing to kind of share this message with you was how do I position the message so that you can get it? Because I think a lot of times when we have deeply technical conversations, we get lost in the technical language without communicating the message so people don't get it. Anyway, so, so um, you know, Mikhail and I were busy talking about economic systems that promise, economic, uh, that promise opportunity to people. And I was saying to him, I was like, dude, look, let me, let me tell you how I look at it, guys. And if you get a sense of how I look at it, then you'll understand it. I was like, for me, if you want to understand what it takes to thrive in an economic system, look at the top 25 wealthiest people in that system. And then look at the top 25 most um, uh, respected people in that economic system. And you'll understand everything you need to know about that economic system. Let me tell you what I'm, what I'm trying to say to you. So... <clears throat> If you live in a country where the top 25 wealthiest people and the top 25 most celebrated people are people who are entrepreneurs, who built businesses from the ground up, who did it without connections to any politician or government or government contracts or huge contracts. I'm talking about guys that started making paper slippers and then sell the paper slipper at a dollar each and then... You know, rather than have one customer paying them a million dollars, they have a million customers paying them a dollar. And that guy builds his business to become one of the wealthiest people in that country. You can bet that in that country, the economic system is one of free markets. And the economic system is one driven by effort and effort matching reward. And that that economic system is one about competence. Usually, not always, but usually. And in those markets, usually you'll find that people who have the highest IQ tend to rise towards the highest echelons of prosperity and wealth. Here's an example. If you look at the U.S. and I say to you, who are, in your mind, who are the billionaires in the U.S. you know about that have done really, really well? Mark Zuckerberg, top IQ, built a business for the billions, now is a billionaire. Jeff Bezos top IQ, Ivy League education, built a business for the billions, now is a billionaire. Ray Dalio, top IQ, right? Built a business that's generated billions of dollars in returns, now is a billionaire. I could just keep going, but if you look at the US and you look at the guys in the US who've made extraordinary amounts of money, these are people who've literally shifted the economic trajectory and system. Larry Page, Sergey, um, Reid Hoffman, who founded LinkedIn, um, Steve Jobs, uh, Andrew Grove, all of these guys who've built these phenomenal businesses, all of them have one thing in common. Even our very own Elon Musk left here to go there because he was an IQ driven guy. And he recognized, and I'm going to make the point, that we don't live in an IQ-driven society. So he went, I've got to go where my strengths give me the highest reward. I've got to go to the environment where I'm going to generate the highest reward based on my strength. Because I'm the kind of guy that will build a business that is driven by competence, not connections. Does that make sense? Juxtapose that with many of our own economies here in the continent. And you know, one of the things I've been careful to do is I hate the, I, I hate Africa bashing. Like I feel like Africa's been through enough. We really don't need to be bashing each other. So this is not me bashing. This is just me reflecting. And I'm, I'm open to being wrong. If you guys think I'm wrong, just tell me where you think I'm wrong and share with me what your own perspectives are. But if you look at Africa, and you look at many of the continents and uh, many of the countries in Africa, look at Latin America, look at many of the countries in Latin America, look at Asia, Look at many of the countries in Asia too, because we love to talk about the Asia countries, but the truth is that their economic system is actually very similar to ours. Even in Russia, economic system, very similar to ours. Those economic systems are not necessarily driven by your level of intellect or competence or cognitive ability. Of course, you have to be smart enough to survive, but you don't have to be the smartest of the pack. They're also not driven by your level of competence because there are people who are much more competent than you who don't have necessarily the same access. What they're driven by tends to be, tends to be access to power. So it's about connection, not competence. 
and they also tend to be driven by access to massive state-funded opportunities that can generate instant wealth for you instant wealth so in those markets all you got to do is be close enough to somebody in power get access to an amazing opportunity that generates you instant wealth tomorrow and you're sorted you're fixed and one of the ways you know this is true is usually what people who live in those markets do is the minute they generate wealth and they get free cash flows from that wealth they will externalize the capital They'll take their money and they'll take it out of the country. You'll very rarely see guys who make money in those countries reinvest in those countries. That's why there are very few people who do government tenders that do venture capital. Because why would I take my money that I'm earning in a government contract and invest it in a high risk alternative uh, asset in instrument that is highly illiquid and where I might lose my money? I'm not going to do that. Why? Because in that market and in that space, and listen to this, when we were talking about this, like my mind shifted. The, the view of the future is different. See, if I'm living in a market driven by competence and free markets, I tend to take a view about the future based on my own competence and ability because it's driven by competence and a free market. So I go, if I'm competent and I can compete, I believe the future is good. But if I live in a market that's driven by connections, then I don't know what the future holds because if the person I'm friends with loses their seat or loses power or is out of office, I don't know where things are going to go. So what am I going to do? The minute I have money, I'm going to externalize it. How do you know this is true? Look at who buys the properties in Switzerland. Look at who buys the properties in Monaco. Look at who's putting money in Liechtenstein. Who are these guys? And where's that money coming from? So how is it that the money coming from a country is not being reinvested in that country? But the people of that country are, are looking for foreign direct investment. I'm confused here. So we're sitting here going, foreigners invest in our own country. But when we're generating money ourselves in our own countries, we're not reinvesting it in our own countries. We're taking that money and externalizing it. We're putting it in other countries, other economies. We're buying homes in Lyon. We're buying homes in the south of France. We're buying homes in Liechtenstein. You're putting your money in pounds. And, and if you're really, really conservative, you're going to take some of your money and put it in gold. But what you're not going to do is take your money and put it in a new business business in that same economy because you don't know what the future looks like we we're just having this conversation i was like boom my mind just shifted and i was like oh then and this is the final note and i'll leave this with you guys <laughs> check this out <laughs> um the cost of all of this is that top talent leaves and the reason top talent leaves is because top talent wants to live in an economy driven by competence, not connections. So if I'm top talent, if I was top 10% of my class, all of my schooling career, and I'm top 10% of my performance quota, all of my professional career, but I don't have a real chance of generating long-term wealth because of the system, I will leave. And I will go to an environment that's going to leverage my assets. Boom. So where do you find... Go to, go to Canada. Go to the US. Some of the smartest bankers are Nigerians. Like some of the smartest people in financial services in the UK. Nigerians. Some of the smartest people working in technology in Malaysia. Kenyans. Some of the smartest people working in construction, engineering in Australia. South Africans. Some of the smartest farmers working in um, uh, Eastern Europe and the Middle East. Zimbabweans. Why? Because top talent will go where it's going to get rewarded and where its asset will be leveraged for its own personal benefit. Boom. <laughs> like we had the, like the whole, I was just like, Yazin, 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 Mikhail, that's it. You win. Lachaim, Lachaim, you win everything. I wanted to share that with you guys. Now, what I'd love to know from you is comment below if you know a friend that you've seen leave a market like the one I'm talking about. Comment below if you know a friend that's left and gone to Europe, gone to the US, gone to Australia, gone to any of the places that have more free markets where you can generate economic wealth for yourself without necessarily having a close, a close connection to power. And tell me about this story because I think one of the things we're not seeing is we're not having a broad-based conversations about the real economic cost of us losing top talent to some of those countries. That's it, guys. Take it easy. Cheers.